In today's Cutter Consortium webinar, Cutter Senior Consultant William Ulrich will talk about and answer your questions about how information systems transformation concepts offer organizations the ability to transform complex IT architectures to achieve critical business requirements and are essential to achieving synchronized and sustainable business IT alignment. William Ulrich is a Senior Consultant with the Cutter Enterprise Architecture Practice, specializing in business architecture. He is also a senior consultant with the business IT strategies in the government and public sector practices. Bill is president of PSG, Inc., and provides advisory mentoring and training services on business architecture and business IT alignment. Bill has more than 30 years of management consulting experience, has written several books, and has mentored numerous corporations and government agencies on business IT alignment. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Mark. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the seminar on an executive guide to information systems transformation. As Mark said, I am uh, Bill Ulrich, and I will be covering today a little different view on how to transform information systems. Topics we're going to be covering today include shifting information systems transformation from what used to be considered more of a tactical option to become a strategic enabler for your organization. We'll talk about launching and sustaining business-driven business IT architectural alignment, specifically by leveraging business architecture as a baseline for strategic planning and business requirements. So part of the discussion today will be on coming at this from a business perspective. And then part of the discussion, of course, is going to be how do I align those systems? And we're going to give you some, some different approaches and techniques for doing that including some specifics on IT modernization approaches and techniques. So what's unique about the overall approach is that it's important to understand both the current state of the business and IT architectures. That tends to get glossed over quite a bit. We understand a little bit about the business, just enough to get going. We may understand a little bit about our current state architectures, but because people are so eager to start with a clean slate, a lot of times we try to lay the building down or put a building down in place without having done the proper site preparation for that building. And as anyone who's been involved in architecting uh, large buildings knows or, or uh, familiar with the process that they go through, there's an entire site preparation crew that's assigned before any actual real building works or, or begins to occur. We're going to talk about defining gaps in the business IT vision that need to be closed and how to fill those gaps. And then we'll talk about aligning gaps with essential business initiatives. One of the differences within this is the degree and depth of engagement of the business community. Uh, stakeholder teams that assemble and provide input, uh, facilitated sessions, uh, but, but also very importantly, the role of the business architect within the business, playing the, a, a similar or counterpart role to the IT architect on the other side of the organization. And then we'll talk about the incremental evolution of current state architectures, something that uh, we've coined the ter term evolutionary architecture, where the new architecture emerges over a window of time from the current state architecture. And most importantly, delivering business value early and often. So business-driven transformation is really more than a slogan. It views the evolution of the IT architecture from a business and an IT perspective. And the most important thing there is understanding how to keep those in sync so the business doesn't get too far out in front of IT or IT doesn't get too far out in front of the business. There's a synchronization of how that occurs with the business vision really influencing the IT vision and, of course, vice versa. It incorporates cross-functional, cross-disciplinary views of how IT enables the business. It's important to understand not just the business view and IT view, but also where business silos are involved, what's the collaborative view or collective view of those business silos from a solution perspective, if that's relevant to the particular project. It allows management and planning teams to view projects within the context of a horizontal approach, and that means if we have seven different business units, all of which are responsible, for example, for a customer management capability, and all of which have overlapping processes which map up to a common value stream. 
we want to take a comprehensive look across those value streams and processes and capabilities so that the solution we provide is a solution for the organization. This is not a boil the ocean approach. It, using these techniques, you can be very pinpoint accurate in terms of the capabilities you deploy as services on the back end or the value streams that you deploy as automation, automated uh, integrated flows across your business processes. It may require changing some of your strategic funding models, but that's, that's another issue that comes along with all of these approaches. And it ensures that there's a synchronized approach to business IT transformation. Just briefly, let's take a, a look at historic approaches of what IT has done to try to better align to the business. And, and these are situations where the business either hasn't been engaged, uh, didn't understand the role that they needed to play in terms of communicating their, their vision and their, and their architecture as a key aspect of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, historically, what's happened is the IT organization moves forward. They have a general stated direction by the business. They lay it, set up a project. There's little engagement from the business side uh, until it becomes a just-in-time necessary situation. And then we go and try to pry requirements in a piecemeal basis out of the business side on a case-by-case-by-case -case -case basis because we can't move forward without those requirements. Uh, where the requirements are not clearly stated or assumed, uh, we move forward anyway. Uh, and, and even the cases where requirements are done well, use cases are developed, uh, good requirements documents are developed from the business side, they're still not put within an architectural framework. So a lot of these projects deal with a greenfield replacement where we're going to write new systems from scratch, uh, middleware integration where we're going to just try to cover up what's on the back end, not touch the back end because we really don't understand those systems. We haven't documented them. We've lost some of the skills that really understand how to change them. So we're going to just try to, as much as possible, gloss over the current state architecture. And also uh, commercial off-the-shelf solutions. Some people call them uh, ERP systems software packages, but things that you can buy and deploy. So those are really the, the three approaches that have historically been employed, and we're not suggesting that in part any one of those approaches are inappropriate within the context of a larger project. But taken independently, greenfield replacement projects tend to cost uh, a lot of money, tend to be fairly risky, and have a reasonably high failure rate. One Standish Group uh, study showed that uh, less 3% or less of, of projects over $10 million have a, have a chance of succeeding. Another uh, study, a series of studies have shown that uh, any new system that's deployed will cost you from $18 to $40 per line of deployed code. And these are multiple studies that have provided that information. That when we're deploying software packages or COT solutions, 35% of those projects are canceled outright. You typically only deploy 40% of promise functionality and only 10% of the projects are on time and on budget. Middleware deployments, uh, again, this is from another, uh, an actual an IBM-based study, found that wrapping uh, solutions uh, that have been laid over flawed legacy architecture, uh, they merely create more duplication within IT architectures that already contain 60 to 80% levels of redundancy. And uh, the 60 to 80% levels of redundancy is also something that came from that study. So if you think about your current state IT architectures and how they mirror the current state business, uh, we have a lot of redundancy deployed, both from a data and uh, an application perspective. Those redundancies tend to be highly siloed so that there's a lack of awareness of where those redundancies exist. Those redundancies are mirrored from a capability and process perspective on the business side. So you have redundancy on both sides of the coin. So when IT tries to align or consolidate or deploy, let's say, a new SOA environment that's going to uh, address some of those redundancies, and the redundancies are not addressed on the business side or not even identified and highlighted on the business side from an architectural perspective, you run into all kinds of confusion and issues that occur, with the data architecture being really where the rubber meets the road and, and the real challenges occur because you don't have any alignment of consistency across your data environment. So those are some of your historic changes. Let's talk about these, these IT architectures for a moment, because this is really the, the area where the, the modernization and the transformation occurs from an IT perspective. 
So we define this as blueprints of the uh, technologies, data structures, and applications that collectively comprise the information technology environment of the overall enterprise. Over to the right-hand side, uh, you'll see how we've broken those out. We have the applications and ser deployed services and service orchestrations over there which make up the application architecture. That's all the pieces of software that the business uses and relies on. We also have the physical and logical data deployments and representations of those data deployments. That's what we call the data architecture. Those two components collectively are heavily impacted whenever there's a business change or evolution of the current state business architecture to some target state. Of course, the underlying platforms and technologies are important, and that's what IT spends a lot of time worrying about. And that, of course, is something that we have to remain concerned about. But, of course, changing just the underlying technology and not changing the application and data architecture doesn't really provide the overall value to the business side because that's what the business really works with. The bottom left-hand side is something that tends to get ignored because they, it, it, they fall out of the line of sight of IT. And being out of line of sight means that the business has deployed solutions of various types, uh, not just Excel spreadsheets or access databases, but much more comprehensive solutions in some cases. They may actually have small systems sitting out there written in various languages. And we run into this on a fairly regular basis across organizations that are frustrated with a lack of responsiveness or the ability to change the current state IT architecture, so they start building their own desktop type solutions and, and ancillary architectures on the, on the outside. But collectively, we have to view all of this as the IT architecture. And if we try to change something and break 150 spreadsheets, that's not necessarily helping the business either. Now, let's flip over to the other side of the coin and say, what about the business? I mentioned business architecture a couple of times, and what I want to do here is just give you a little insight into what's underneath there. Uh, first of all, a definition. A business architecture is a blueprint of the enterprise, and when you think blueprint, think multiple blueprints, that provides a common understanding of the organization and is used to align strategic objectives and tactical demands. This is all of the representations of everything that doesn't cons that's, that's not deployed software or deployed technologies or future deployed software and future deployed technologies. And when people say, well, what's the difference? I'm not clear on, on, on the clarity of the difference here. Well, roll yourself back 80 years in time to 1930. You would still have a business architecture, but you wouldn't have an IT architecture because there were no technological deployments that, were, that would be available to automate your business. So everything that's inside this circle would still largely exist in 1930 as it does today. The difference today is we've automated many of the portions of the things that are inside this circle, and they're intricately tied to the, uh, to the technologies that are currently out there. That's why we have to be so careful to understand what's the current state, not just of the IT side, but also of the business side, so that we can move things forward in an architected, orchestrated manner. So a couple of the points about what's in here, uh, business capabilities, uh, very much the core of the business architecture. It's what the business does. It's not how it's done. And a lot of organizations are beginning to deploy capability maps and start to map those capabilities to other pieces of their business architecture. Why do you do things? Well, you do things because you want to do them, vision, strategies, and tactics, and you do things because you have to do them, policies, rules, and regulations. That's what drives action. That was, that's what drives activity. That is largely also what drives funding for projects and initiatives. And that's what really makes the motivation go and, and, and uh, to begin to modify these architectures. So the question is, what are those? Are they clearly articulated? And what is the overall impact on the business architecture? And how do we translate that impact to the IT architecture? We also have the organization units as well as customers, suppliers, and competitors. Uh, we have, uh, of course, products and services and assets. We have decisions and events. We have initiatives and projects, as I talked about a minute ago. We have the processes that flow horizontally across the organization. And then, of course, last but not least, is the information and the vocabulary that the business uses. What are those information assets? So with this being the business architecture, the question is, how do we represent these things? Well, today, many of these things are represented 
in a variety of ways. And if you look at all of the different sample blueprints on the right, some of these are, can be generated by tools, and others are just a uh, you know, combination of Visio and PowerPoint. Uh, the, but those representations are important because this is what the business is using in many cases to manage your organization. Balanced scorecard, very, very common. Capability maps, uh, gaining much, much more commonplace. Uh, value chains uh, are, this is the Porter example. Um, to the right, we have business processes and, and the value streams that, that they decompose from. Uh, operational models, uh, information flows, uh, asset models, supply chain models, production models, um, also business IT mappings where we just have basic cross mappings. So a lot of these examples here are just blueprints that are being used today. So what's different about business architecture from all of these uh, PowerPoint presentations and Visio presentations that we have floating around our organizations today that have been developed by, say, you know, dozens of different consultants or dozens of different internal people. The difference here is that we now have a vocabulary to define the contents of what's in those blueprints, and we also have the ability to represent the business with a defined vocabulary along the left-hand side there, such as capabilities and value streams and processes and so on. And that defined vocabulary can be represented in a much more formal way. And it can not only subsume and take in the information within these different blueprints, but over time, it becomes a source for those blueprints. So that my capability map can then map across to my value streams and, my, and down to my processes. The information representations that I have from a business perspective can map across to the different areas that need that information. The organizational models can be mapped to capabilities and so on. So I not only have a vocabulary, but I have a way of relating the information about my business that's defined by that vocabulary. That's the difference with business architecture. It's putting a formality to all of the kinds of things that the business has been using so far and adding some new things to that. So what are the implications of having a poorly aligned business IT architecture? Well, one is that large-scale IT projects uh, – that do little to achieve strategic or business uh, tactical objectives, they really struggle. So you have large projects and you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars over a period of years on these projects, and you start to look at what value are these projects really delivering from a strategic perspective? How do these projects impact my strategy and my business vision going forward on a year-in, year-out basis? And if all of these projects come to fruition, where will I be in five years? Will I have most of my strategies achieved, most of my requirements achieved, or will there still be a lot of outstanding types of things? So am I spending my money wisely? And the question is, if you're not, then, the, then we have to reevaluate what the alignment is between the business and the IT architecture. Uh, indecision as to how to allocate annual funding. Um, another challenge across large portfolios, everybody wants money, and they're all going to spend it on the same thing within their silo. But that's how we fund things today. Uh, for example, consolidating and redundant, redundantly deployed business capabilities, uh, I may have claims deployed across 16 different places. I may have procurement being done in many different places. Uh, I, may, I may do account management or people management in many different places. Those are just examples of the kinds of things that are being done that cost the business a lot of money and in some cases uh, can cost you in both uh, customers, uh, market share, and also in, in, uh, in, in basic uh, valuing of your organization. Uh, customer initiatives that span product lines, divisions, and, and regions, how do we address those? What about mergers, acquisitions, or reorganizations that occur? And finally, you end up with a dangerous spiral of escalating projects with the diminishing returns. And a lot of those escalating projects, um, some of which are enterprise-based, but many of which are very silo-based, uh, have have a low level of value, and you keep moving forward with them even in spite of the fact that you can't demonstrate when they're going to be done and what kind of value they're going to deliver. So let me talk about the, um, the current state and vision state of the business architecture. So you say, here's the way our organization looks today, and we have these, you know, these different value streams, one of which may be to um, – you know, license something or issue a product or uh, provide something to a stakeholder. Another one may be to maintain that thing for the external stakeholder. 
Another one may be internal, such that we're going to um, uh, uh, develop a new product or establish a new product, and so on. And there may be things we can't currently do, like managing a portfolio for our customers. And that may be a whole new thing that you need to add, so that may be an additional capability that, that doesn't exist today. The question is, if we want to change those types of things in the future and we want to move forward, uh, what are those things? Can we articulate the differences from the current state to the target state business architecture that we're going to incur? And if we do change that, what's the impact on the current state IT architecture, which I'm showing you here the mapping to? And what does the new IT architecture need to look like? What is the IT vision that needs to align to that target state business vision? And then the big question is, how do I incrementally get there in an ROI-driven journey? where I'm going to deliver business value out of the gate on an ongoing basis, incrementally, and through a series of deployments where any particular failure was going to be a small and relatively inconsequential failure as opposed to a large and devastating and highly costly failure so that you're going through and innovating and re-innovating and re-innovating, continuously moving through various incremental interim states of your target until you can largely agree that you've achieved this new future state business and IT architecture. Of course, there's always going to be that incremental move to want to get better, so we never really see this cycle ending. It's continuous. Okay? Um, I just lost my Adobe Connect, and I'm not sure why, but it's attempting to reconnect. So bear with me. Um, oops. Let's see if I can get around this. Um, Okay, it looks like I'm back in, and I will keep going here. Uh, although, Mark, I'm just going to need you to give me presenter's permission again because I've, I've lost presenter's permission for some reason. It just dropped me off and just reattached me. Yeah. Yes, will do. Thank you. So the most important thing here is to understand that there's a synchronization that has to occur, and that synchronization is something that you, you really need to manage and manage it along the way, and that the business plays an active role and that IT plays an active role. There's a high degree of engagement in this. So the question is why? Well, the business and IT architectures are continuously changing. It requires a highly agile approach to deliver this incremental value. So we probably want to get much more agile with the delivery that we need to, with the delivery approaches we need to bring to the table. And again, there needs to be a high degree of business engagement in those agile delivery approaches. When the business and IT are out of sync, it results in a lot of issues, as we talked about a little earlier, failed projects, pro project cost overruns, projects that are never delivered, uh, business and IT struggling to articulate uh, and quantify requirements, IT shoving solutions that the business it can't accept or benefit from. Uh, think, of, think of any efforts you run where you went out and got a commercial software package and you brought it in and you tried to deploy it, but it just wouldn't fit into the organization and into the business architecture. Uh, business professionals losing trust in IT. Uh, business professionals creating shadow systems uh, on the desktops and so forth to work around the IT architecture, and real business performance opportunities being ignored by IT because they look like little things that we don't have time to spend our time on because we want to really spend our time on a lot of these big back-end architectures. So the goal here is to achieve a state in which application and data architectures evolve in continuous harmony with the business architecture. But in order to do that, you have to have some of the mappings that we talked about earlier. So let's uh, um, take a look at some sample business IT alignment scenarios. These are very common things that organizations are trying to do all the time that, that we can align around. Uh, merger and acquisition, analysis and deployment. How do we align and consolidate things like customer management, product management, account management? These are all business capabilities that are, that are out there and typically deployed across multiple business units. And as you bring those new business units in and bring them together, the question is, how do we align the organization? And then just as importantly, what's the back-end impact when you, do that, that when you do that merger acquisition alignment to the IT architectures? Uh, business unit consolidation, uh, some similar kinds of things. New product and service rollout. What are all the impacts, and, and how do I make those changes, and how do I deploy that? New line of business, supplier consolidation uh, from a procurement perspective. Regulatory compliance. How do I ensure that I'm getting regulatory uh, compliance. One of the reasons people document their business architectures is 
for the mere fact that um, there's a lot of regulators and auditors who are getting much smarter about looking at, at the business, and they want to see where things are done and how they're being done. And you can start to see that that, that, that can be supplied through this documentation. Uh, operational cost analysis and reduction and investment funding analysis. Again, just a couple of examples. Let me talk about this, uh, this horseshoe view here. Uh, we call this the, uh, uh, the horseshoe um, uh, transformation view or model, and there's a reason for it. And, uh, you know, th there's, there's some good conversations you can have around this particular view. There's the concept of physical architecture transformation from an IT perspective, and this is along the lower bottom. Uh, this physical transformation is I'm swapping in and out new servers, uh, I'm trying to virtualize. I'm trying to replatform things. Um, I may want to go to cloud. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I want to be able to move things around much more freely through a virtual environment. Uh, it, it may that may include um, SOA as a vehicle to achieve that. Um, but basically, I, I want to be able to do that. And I can't do that today because I'm stuck in a bunch of proprietary environments. And if the business is perfect and the application architecture and data architecture is all perfect and the only problem is it's just in the wrong language and, and, and it's not in an open platform environment and all I want to do is move it to a language that, that you know, that, that can run and be supported by, by Linux operating environment and I can virtualize all that, then you just want to move across that bottom. But I really haven't seen in my experience the, the perfect business, perfect application and perfect data architectures where uh, moving across that bottom row or that bottom line would just really provide you the high degrees of business and, and overall business value that you're trying to achieve. So then we say, well, we really need to add some application capabilities and, and maybe eliminate some and make changes to our baseline data architecture. And, and, and when you start to move into that middle layer, that logical view layer, that logical transformation layer, the question is, well, if I'm going to do that, how do I know what my targets are? And that naturally brings you up to the top of the horseshoe, which says, I have to understand my business and my business transformation requirements, and that's how I need to come across. And what I, what I will suggest to you is if you've been involved in um, any sort of modernization or transformation efforts, uh, one of the experiences that we've seen out there is that they're very, very difficult to sustain when you're only moving across that bottom rung. Uh, and, and one example of that is I've got a bunch of power builder and I want to get rid of my power builder and I'm going to move it to Java and I'm going to have it, have it on virtualized servers and, you know, I'll be eventually be able to, sh you know, move it off into the cloud and that type of thing. And, and the question is what business value have they delivered? And if it's only to get rid of that technology and everything else is perfect, that's fine. And the business may not even notice that you spent the money. So when you're looking for business value, you really have to start to move up that horseshoe. And if you believe that there's no business value to be had or no business value needs to be added, then you can certainly stay at the bottom of the horseshoe. But my experience is that, that uh, more often than not, you're going to need to move up that horseshoe and understand the, the, big, the big picture. Um, so as you're moving across, let's, uh, this, this is um, one example of a business architecture blueprint that's called the um, – uh, it's called a core diagram. Uh, one organization was using this, and it, and it says, we have a lot of ways into our organization. 15, 16 different ways that, an that, that, that a customer can contact us. When they contact us, they go into one of 14 or 15 different silos. Those silos include our mutual funds and our investments and our banking and our various insurance lines. And each of those travel from end to end across a series of processes. And a customer is getting a notification that they've changed their address or they've changed their phone number. And they get this notification, but all of their mail and all of their information keeps going to the wrong place for all of the other products that they own because you can own multiple products across multiple product lines. How do I spend my energy and time to make a, a highly valued change to reduce my, my customer attrition and, and my competitive losses so that I can begin to impact this? Well, over the long term, you want to move from, from the left-hand side to the right side. So you've got a consolidated value stream driven view with value stream breaking down into process, business processes there. You can see that it's, it's all consolidated. The back end architecture is consolidated, but somebody might say, well, that's going to take us years to do that. And admittedly, it's, it's a difficult challenge when you have a lot of entrenched IT architectures. So then the question is, how do I really invest my energies to focus on the piece of the value stream that's going to give me the most value? So the interim view of this, which I'm not showing, just consolidates the very front end of the business processes 
into a common stream so that there's a notification that goes out so everybody can get notified that there's a change of address and then the customer can actually get notified that the change is actually occurring. Uh, very simple, very low cost fix. It was done based on a business architecture view of what needed to be done to the IT architectures. There were all these hundreds of millions of dollars projects going on in the background around IT. Uh, the, the solution for this, which reversed customer attrition and, and customer losses uh, within a period of months and started moving the trend the other direction, uh, only cost a few hundred thousand dollars. So what I'm suggesting here is that when you take a business-driven view of a solution, it may not be elegant, it may not be fancy, but it's going to be of value to the business, and that's the focal point. So let's break down one of our, our value streams here. This is a, a very, very high-level end-to-end, and, and down below this there's lots of processes, which I'm not going to talk about right now, um, that that would enact this, uh, you know, beginning to middle, middle to middle, middle to end types of processes. And, and each stage of the value stream, uh, inquiry, apply for product, accept uh, application, and so forth and so on, uh, would map down to those different processes. And, and that is where you're going to get your, uh, um, your automation and your workflow and your consolidation. But it should be done from a business architecture perspective so that you've got people modeling processes all over your organization. In fact, one organization we found that we had a value stream that mapped to 75 unique and, and separate yet um, basically identical processes. They did the exact same thing. There were 75 different deployed process models across the organization by a bunch of people that didn't even know each other, never even spoke to each other, but they had modeled the same processes and they did the exact same thing. They updated customer information. So when we roll that view back up into a value stream view, we can start to get much more of an architectural perspective, start to have some strategic planning decisions around it and say, where do I want to focus my energies? How do I want to, how do I want to um, automate and align these processes from an end-to-end -end perspective so that I can really start incrementally delivering value? Where do I focus first? How do I tackle it? Where are the biggest challenges from a value stream perspective? Now, below this, I have something else that uh, I want to introduce here. And that's the concept of the what is being done within the business, the capabilities. Now, you'll see here that there are certain capabilities that map to various stages within the value stream. And there's techniques for this within business architecture. Those capabilities translate over to the back-end IET architecture so that you can say, well, we really want to have a consolidated approach to um, updating our uh, customer information or uh, to managing an application uh, and we want to create a service to do that. And the question is, where does that service get invoked along the way? Well, it's going to get invoked uh, from the automated processes that result from this uh, particular value stream. So you can bring together a dual mapping here. At the front layer, you can tackle it from a value stream process automation perspective. And from a back-end architecture uh, viewpoint, we can start to use the values or the, the business capabilities rather to decouple the back-end uh, architecture and to start to deploy um, business services that can really uh, bring you new approaches and new ways for, for automating the, uh, the work that you do. Here's an example of a, uh, a billing environment where there were three billing units, business units, uh, three unique sets of business processes, and uh, three sets of back-end systems. So the value stream driven approach that was applied to this, which looked at across all of the different silos and the, and the, the nuances and differences within their processes, we took a value driven stream approach to this to consolidation. And what that allowed us to do was to have the horizontal visibility to say, we're not just going to fix a process here or fix a process there. We're going to really take this thing from a value stream perspective and and take a look at it and say we're going to go into that portion of the value stream that de deals with billing and we're going to consolidate and automate that and we're going to end up with something that looks like this so what we said is that yeah you still have different business units but now you've got common process that that takes care of that portion of the value stream uh we've added um a new front end to that and we've we've hidden these back end systems so what's emerged here in the middle is what we call a mini architecture. And it, it can be deployed with COT solutions or it can be deployed with, with in-house solutions. It might be a combination of case management, business process management, rules engines. 
the, the technology deployments isn't, aren't really the, the key issue here. It's the solution approach that's business driven. And this is taking a business driven approach to business IT alignment. Now let's take a look at the back end and some of our pictures got uh, a little bit clouded away here, but that, that's fine. I think we have the general concept. Uh, we, we, we dealt with the user view and so much of what we're trying to accomplish here is, is, you know, this user centered view of the world or user centric view of the world. We've dealt with that in, in the value stream alignment and process alignment approach, right? So we've taken that approach and it was a very engaging, very agile, um, you know, evolutionary deployment of, of the process automation across those different areas. Uh, that, that's that been handled, and that's going to have a direct bearing on the ultimate view, which is to consolidate the business units and to eventually consolidate the back-end systems into a, into a common set of systems. So we're moving from three sets of billing applications with a redundant data architecture into a common data architecture and into a common set of systems. What becomes the driver for that? It's those business capabilities that I was talking about which have a direct mapping to the current state IT architecture and the target state IT architecture. So what you end up with over a window of time, and you can deploy these a, a service at a time, uh, you can do it in multiple services, you start to replace the current state middleware, you start to decouple and over a window of time uh, uh, diminish the back-end architectures in, in favor of replacing them with these new modern uh, SOA-based environments and deployments. And it's capability-driven, so you can do, with, again, with pinpoint accuracy, take the business view, which is, are those capabilities in the middle, and you can see how they map across to that capability map. You can take those capabilities in the middle, and you can begin to selectively automate, either automate, reuse, transform in some way, or decommission the stuff at the back end, so that over a window of time, you're eating away at that back-end architecture, and it starts becoming the evolutionary view of the new, of the new target back-end application and data architecture. Of course, the data architecture needs to be brought along with this, and that um, we're not really going through any demonstration of that here, but there is a parallel effort to uh, evolve the current state data architecture and eventually move it to the new target state data architecture. And it's one of the more difficult challenges that, that faces organizations in transformations. This is just an example of the kind of things you can do when you're, when you're taking a capability-based view to decouple the current state application over a window of time uh, with various uh, modernization tools that provide both the analysis, uh, the uh, code slicing, the, the logic extraction capacity to, to be able to do this. And, and to really, to, at a minimum, to understand so you can decouple the current state uh, but in a best case solution, maybe potentially even reuse and migrate some of the pieces so you can reuse them in, in the target state. It's a capability based approach. You can use COT solutions within here if you need to plug those in. Uh, you, you can, you can write new services or you can, you can do an actual uh, migration transformation. So those are some of the ideas there behind that. And I just want to revisit the horseshoe here again because I think it's important to understand that what I was showing you on that last slide has been done by organizations, but they've never been able to deploy it at a strategic, sustainable level because of the lack of the tie-in to the business architecture, the lack of the, of the mapping to the business capabilities and, and, and to the, the application architecture and the app backend data architecture, the lack of the mapping between the value streams and the business processes and the user interfaces and, and the new deployments that need to evolve and occur. Right, so if you're just going to take a tactical view of modernization, uh, one example being lift and shift, which is a no business value, um, little business visibility approach to moving across the bottom line versus the architected solutions, which really need to be deployed and engage with the business architecture to deliver the near-term and ongoing business value, building long-term sponsorship and funding and sustainability of this whole effort. Uh, also, I just introduce here just briefly the concept of rapid response teams, which focus on the value stream alignment and automation. So those are very agile teams that work along the front ends directly with the uh, with the business stakeholders. Uh, this is just called the uh, the four corners, the transformation four corners uh, picture was adopted out of a, a book that I had done, uh, where these scenarios drive the disciplines that you need to uh, embrace from business and IT architecture perspective. 
which drives the technologies that you need. It shouldn't be the reverse. The technologies don't drive the approach. The, the approach drives the technologies. And then uh, any standards that you want to align with, you can borrow from as well. And of course, the vendors should be doing that anyway. What you should really think about when thinking about information systems transformation, one is, have you considered all the relevant aspects of the business architecture? Do you even have a business architecture? Are you looking at something that you can use to, to put your head on as far as the business architecture perspective? Can the business articulate an ROI value for each delivery stage? Or do you go on for a period of one to two years without delivering any business value? Have you aligned the initiative to related initiatives? Are there other things happening in your organizations that impact the same value streams, capabilities, and information assets? Are there incremental project steps under a commonly agreed upon strategy so that you can deliver things in incremental approaches? A couple of points here on uh, if you are employing or deploying um, uh, these solutions to your back-end software architectures. Uh, there's several approaches. Um, you know, one is to do it yourself, get a tool, figure out how to, you're going to use it. Um, normally, you're, you're going to be minimally at the service-supported approach where you may want to do some work in-house, but you're going to need some, some service support. You may want to insource and actually bring skills in-house from the outside, or there's some things that you could outsource. Now, out, totally outsourcing um, the modernization of IT architectures, you have to be extremely careful. There's only a subset of tasks which work well, and they work very well when you outsource them. For example, I want to I want to take this set of software and I want to move it into a a you know automatically move it into a new Java environment, for example. But not understanding this uh, has gotten folks into a lot of uh, a lot of issues um, and outsourcing the wrong pieces versus insourcing the wrong pieces. Some common roadblocks: uh, silo-based funding of initiatives. Uh, you end up repaving the technological cow paths. It stymies creativity, uh, efforts to uh, horizontal alignment. It locks enterprises into a silo-oriented death, death spiral of failed projects uh, because you keep having all of these spiral, th these projects within these silos uh, struggling because they, they can't get out of their business unit silos. Uh, broken business IT engagement models, a lack of direct business IT engagement, and a lack of engagement and vision by the business is, is a real critical issue there. Uh, there needs to be much, much more engagement than the traditional uh, IT project has had from a business perspective. And it's not trying to pull requirements out of them. It's taking a business architecture-based approach, doing facilitated sessions, doing user-facilitated designs, and, and moving forward from there. Very agile um, because you can't get the requirements out in, in other ways. So, so those are some different ways of doing that. And the continued use of traditional solutions that have really struggled in the past. I want to give you a couple of reference points here just going forward if, if, uh, if, if you want to read up a little more on some of these kinds of things. There's, uh, there's three books um, that, that I put out. Um, first, first top two were co-authored. The third one, I was the sole author. Uh, they, they, if, if you're going to try to tackle something like this, uh, probably recommend reading them in, in top to bottom order because they, that's, that's pretty much how they sort of lay out the, the approach and strategy. Business architecture, the art and practice of business transformation, information systems transformation, uh, in architecture driven modernization case studies, and legacy systems transformation strategies. There's also some standards bodies that support uh, the, both the IT end of this as well as the uh, business architecture event, uh, end of that, and you can see that those are uh, provided there as well. And, of course, you want to have standards to support all of this. So with that, what I'd like to do is, uh, is thank Cutter for all the hosting that they've done today. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark and open it up for some questions. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, as Bill said, at this point, we would like to move into the Q&A session. Uh, to ask a question using the Q&A function, just type it into the bar at the bottom of the Q&A pod and then click on the speech balloon to the right of that bar. Uh, we do have a few questions, and, and the first question, Bill, is why, why should business be engaged in an IT transformation effort? Uh, good question, Mark. The, the business should be engaged in an IT transformation effort because um, doing IT transformation in the, uh, it, when, there, when there's no understanding of the business transformation that, that either are occurring or need to occur uh, means that you're going to be doing it in a vacuum. And so many IT projects have been have been worked on and delivered in a vacuum, uh, without truly engaging with and understanding the requirements. And you may say, well, we've talked to the major stakeholders, and we generally know what they want. 
there's an uh, incredible amount of, uh, I guess, an understanding gap or, or uh, uh, even a, a reality gap between the folks on the ground who do the work and sometimes the executives that are out there. Uh, what we've seen on an ongoing basis is executives say, well, you know, everything's gone pretty well and, and, you know, I don't think we really have any major issues. We just, we just wish the systems were, you know, we weren't spending so much money on the systems and, and that, you know, we had a little better support from the organ, IT organization. Reality is that, uh, the organization's struggling. There's major issues that have, that, that do surface, um, you know, that, that you need to know about and there needs to be an engagement across the board because, when one uh, one cutter study that uh, that I worked on found that sixty um, percent of uh, business people uh, wanted to keep their old legacy systems instead of instead of using the newly deployed uh, uh, commercial off the shelf software that uh, that the software package that was brought in. Uh, of those, uh, uh, you know, a huge percentage wanted to keep their desktop Excel spreadsheets. In fact, they were ninety-eight percent of them were forced to change uh, their business processes and didn't like it. So there's a resistance and a pushback because IT in that example got way out in front of the business in terms of what was needed. But even more importantly, if IT doesn't understand where the business is going, you can't really create a strategic view. And the only way to do that is to get a high degree of business engagement in a formal way, using business architecture and, and other types of facilitated session techniques. Okay, thank you, Bill. We do have another question. Um, isn't IT transformation just tool-driven? In other words, can we just give tools to the programmers and leave it at that? Um, so uh, we've been doing that for about uh, 25 years, and there's different. There's a different uh, view of uh, – of uh, the technologies out there today than, than what had been out there 25 years ago, of course. Uh, so when we do that, uh, we take probably the most tactical view. And, and, and certainly uh, I'm a big proponent of, of the technicians having and the technical people having as many uh, analysis tools and diagnostic tools as possible. But uh, just providing uh, tools without strategy will, will give you – some marginal value from, uh, you know, a research and maintainability perspective, and, and that, that might be fine and that might be very useful to you. And, and, and if you're not really trying to plan and do any, anything else more strategically, that could probably work and, and that may be fine. But uh, the only way you're going to really drive uh, the, the real uh, effective um, and highly valued use of those technologies is through having an overall transformation strategy and understanding exactly where those tools fit. And in those examples, you're going to use these tools in different ways. There's, uh, there's different types of uh, analyses that would be performed, for example, within the context of determining uh, where and how uh, product information or customer information or account information is being used across six systems then there would be for a programmer who's going in to make a change to a customer address just within the context of a single system. So there's different analyses that occur. The tools support both types of analyses, uh, but there's a lot of different techniques and a lot of different types of, of uh, uh, research that you have to do using those tools that's very, very different from the tactical approaches that a given programmer might use just from a tool, just if you hand a tool to them. And, again, the, the programmers are delivering uh, tactical value on an ongoing basis as opposed to uh, a strategic transformation where you're really trying to get uh, a broader view. And, and, and by the way, some of the tools are good, but they only go up to a certain layer, and some layer of the IT architecture needs to be developed, the views of the IT architecture at some layer, particularly mapping over to the business architecture at the higher levels, uh, needs to be developed from more of an analytical perspective, not just from a tools perspective. So good question. Great. Thanks, Bill. And it looks like we have one more question. Um, how should I get going? Well, that's a great one. So, um, you know, what, one of the ways is to really determine where your high-value needs are from a business perspective. And if you're looking for, you know, and if, if you don't have any high-level needs, okay, that's fine. You're, you're a lucky organization. But most organizations have uh, a hot button list at the executive level that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, we, we need to treat our customers with a single view or our stakeholders with a common view. 
that's one of them. And, and, and that is a, uh, a very common need and an excellent uh, business IT transformation type of scenario to pursue. Uh, another one might be we really need to consolidate the 16 different areas and, and, you know, here and 17 different areas here that basically do the same thing and we've got all these different processes and technologies that do that. Well, you know, the, the, the way folks start, sort, of, sort of start doing that as they start, you know, modeling low-level processes. Well, well, that's all well and good, and you do need that, and, and it's never to be discouraged because it's going to be, play a big, important role as you move forward. But in order to get a, a high-level cross-functional perspective that you can have a conversation with an executive about in terms of where to start, where to focus in, those value streams are discussion, are, are, can provide that discussion means, and you can say, you know, we really need to focus in here, here, and here. Well, how did you get to that point? Well, somebody said, well, we just don't, we don't deploy this particular capability very well. Well, what seems to be the problem? Well, we have, we're struggling with the fact that, you know, we just can't update this information or, or we, we, we're losing track of these accounts. So because that capability is weak, the question is, well, where is that capability being deployed? Well, it's deployed both within our, our, uh, uh acquire a new product value stream. It's deployed across the, uh, maintain a product value stream. It's, it's deployed across the maintain customer value stream. It's deployed across our internal value streams where we're dealing with uh, some internal design issues. It's deployed across multiple value streams. Well, the, you know, where do we want to get the biggest bang right up front? We can, we can create the new capability from a technology perspective. It's going to have an impact on our back-end systems. It's going to have an impact on our on our data architectures, but the question is, where do we deploy it? Where do we get the most value? And that's going to be at, at the client-facing or, or customer-facing level, and that's going to be to understand the value streams and the processes that need to be tackled and automated, and you can start to look at those stages and say, well, stage by stage, we're going to, we're going to begin to tackle this, but we're going to get the most value by tackling this very first stage uh, of, of acceptance and notification or acceptance and distribution of the information. So, so you can really start to focus in and with laser-like uh, accuracy, take it from the executive level all the way down across the processes uh, through the back-end systems environments and really understand where you want to invest. And those investments can become very strategic and they may be a lot less money than you potentially are spending today on, on large IT projects. Great. Well, thank you, Bill, for this excellent presentation. And on behalf of everyone at Cutter, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. If you have further questions or comments about the content presented in today's webinar, we encourage you to call or email Bill at wulrich at cutter.com. Please also visit cutter.com and go to the events section where you can register for other upcoming webinars and events.